Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reading Old Handwriting with the Library of Virginia. We're delighted to see so much interest in this topic. Whether you're using the Library of Virginia collections for research or transcribing archival documents on making history transcribe, reading old handwriting is essential to understanding the past. I'm Sonia Coleman. Myself and my colleague, Jesse Bennett, will be moderating today's session. You can message us directly using the chat feature if you have questions or technical difficulties. We ask that all participants remain muted with your video off to conserve bandwidth, please. And if you have questions, please add them to the chat window. I will read them out following the presentations. This session will be recorded so that the video can be shared for continuing instruction. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to editor and historian John Deal and circulation and archival assistant Anna Molis for today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. All right, so many of you may be familiar with already with the Making History Transcribe website through the Library of Virginia. Uh, and there is a transcripts and tips page accessible through the through that website. And you'll find tips tailored to the material available here at to transcribe at, at the Library of Virginia. It also has some tips for basic formatting guidelines to be aware of while using and making the Making History Transcribe website, as well as FAQs and some examples of common abbreviations. This presentation will expand on these basics. So it's not always pretty. Reading old handwriting takes time and effort and practice. Each writer has a slightly different style. Example alphabets show the letters at their best, but not in actual documents, it can get pretty messy. The people writing the documents we're transcribing today would probably be surprised how much effort goes into deciphering their writing. It's not always easy, but with practice and patience, patterns such as common phrases, unique letter formation, and abbreviations will become more familiar. Capital letters are, often have more flourishes and details. They can look similar to other letters or be mistaken for two letters. Capital letters can be tricky, and some writers will capitalize whatever words they feel like instead of following modern rules. If you're stuck, use the rest of the word to see what letter might logically be. The examples on this page highlight some letters that can mimic others. So you can see, um, most of these are names, but you can see that there's a lot of capital letters that can sort of look very similar to other capital letters, so be on the lookout for that. So with letter variation, a single letter may appear several different ways, even in the same word or throughout the same doc the whole document. The writer may have a specific way of forming a certain letter that's not common or is very unique to their personality and the way that they write. With no set rules for how letters should look, you'll likely see a lot of variation. Some going letter by sometimes going letter by letter through a word can help. If you find a clearer example in of um, in one word you can always go back and compare it to previous words that have you stumped. Signatures are, um, can be difficult to transcribe because the style looks different than the rest of the document, often because it was written in the writer's own handwriting. It's different than the, than the person who's the scribe who's written the rest of the document. They can also contain abbreviations and fancy capital letters. The letters can also run together and often use abbreviations. Some um, common ones can be found on the transcription tips page. So abbreviations, like many folks uh, uh, today, they use abbreviations in all kinds of uh, handwriting. Uh, and of course, the et cetera, which is uh, uh, we use uh, DO and the slash marks are for ditto. Uh, you'll see that a lot in uh, financial records and um, in uh, census records and those kinds of things. You've also got lots of names that are abbreviated. Uh, the usual ones, B-E-N-G for Benjamin, E-D-W for Edward, J-N-O for John, J-S for James. Um, you'll see with the Robert and Samuel example that there's a superscript uh, T and a superscript uh, L uh, for those names. And the examples that you see um, there, there's lots of those things. So like uh, Thomas in the middle at the bottom, it's T-H-O with an S as a, uh, as a superscript. 
Um, you also see a lot of times if somebody has a name like McFadden or one of those Mc MC names, uh, the C might be uh, above the M uh, as a superscript or sometimes uh, below as a subscript uh, just to confuse us. Um, and you'll also see uh, like Robert and Samuel not necessarily using the superscript, but let's say R-O-B-T and S-A-M-L. So um, uh, lots of abbreviations um, in, in documents. And let's see what else we've got. So here are uh, some more examples. Military terms are often uh, abbreviated. Instant, um, adjutant, uh, brigade, captain. Captain can be C-A-P or C-A-P-T, of course. Uh, things like infantry, uh, obedience, and regiment uh, are often uh, abbreviated. And here's a, an example from a, uh, and it's uh, the closing, uh, if sometimes if we have, and Anna mentioned, um, signatures are often uh, pretty tough. And, uh, and so here's one where it's not just the signature, but the closing. You know, lots of formal documents sort of 19th century and, and back, uh, they were very formal in their closing. And so like this one, it'll say sort of very respectfully, and it's your OBT, obedient, S-C-R-V-N-T, servant. So again, it's very deferential. And you'll see that a lot of times, not only in military um, uh, uh, letters and documents, but also in business and certainly in government and matters of states. Uh, luckily, the, um, the uh, signature here is pretty clear. It's a C, Derek. And you'll see that Mr. Derek is actually Lieutenant Colonel Derek, right? LT period, C-O-L period. And he is commanding, C-O-M-D-G, a little G right there, um, commanding. And of course, B-A-L-T, uh, Baltimore. So um, uh, uh, lots of times, uh, another issue with signatures and um, that I've noticed when I've been uh, uh, approving um, uh, making history documents is if there is a letterhead or if there is a, uh, a personalized stationery, a lot of times that will match the signature at the end of the document. And it may seem obvious, but sometimes we don't think about that. And so if you've got let's say a five page letter and you're on page five where the signature is and you can't make it out. Well, if there is stationary or a letterhead, go back to that first page. Maybe the signature is the vice president of this corporation or it's uh, a director of this corporation or let's say the, uh, the, the, the personalized stationery just has somebody's initials. That may be enough to help you get the rest of the word. Uh, so again, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about context uh, quite a bit here, but that's just kind of a neat trick that we don't always think about since we don't really use as much personalized stationery as, uh, as people once did because we don't write as many, as many letters. All right, so uh, the leading S, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in uh, documents such as, and it resembles the sort of cursive F and it mostly shows up where the first S in the words, where there are two S's next to each other. And so here you see the Congress of the United States with the F for the double S. And of course, um, you can see here uh, a Jesse, J-E-S-S-E -S -S -E, with that F. Uh, it looks like an F, but actually it's a leading S. And we'll see those in a few documents uh, coming up here in a, uh, in a second. Um, so some, some things to, to look out for, uh, depositions and, um, uh, and so again, the leading S can look like other letters, for an example, P. And again, as we talked about, the superscript letters can be attached to the next letter as we have here in McReynolds and we have depositions uh, of attorneys. So we've got split words. Sometimes words will be split uh, between lines with one or without a dash. When transcribing, be sure to join with the word. Uh, essentially important with the names because transcribe, uh, essentially the search engine needs the whole words to be able um, to, uh, to search on those names. 
And here we've got a good example of a James uh, Simpkins, uh, here where those uh, arrows are. I think this is one for Anna. So often you'll run across a phrase that like in this document, the phrase that's circled is be in court. Um, and in the first, the, the top example, I was having trouble understanding what it was saying because it has a dot before and after the T, which may be how this person indicates crosses teased, or maybe they just accidentally left a dot, but it was making me think that there was an I in the word court. But you can see in the bottom example, in a later instance of the same, um, the same person writing, they wrote it a little bit more clearly. You can even see that it says court. Um, so it's, it can be very helpful to compare letters written by the same person in different instances. And you can always come back to something if you're stuck on it um, with fresh eyes later. So you go through the rest of the document, you might find something that will help you with something earlier and that you're having trouble with. So here's a good example of the, uh, the leading S that we were talking about earlier. Um, and speaking of, uh, so this person, and this is an indenture, which is essentially a legal document. And again, the context uh, is important. Um, if you're, if it's a legal document, it's not going to have sort of uh, the word love in it or some sort of emotional thing. And if you're writing a love letter, it's not going to have the word acres in it, uh, I hope. Um, so in this indenture, as, as Anna was saying earlier about uh, using um, similar um, uh, similar words to figure out how the person is writing. This person, luckily, the handwriting is really good, but the person decides that they do not want to cross their T's. And so we see uh, um, in this sentence, 1,820, and the T's are not crossed. Down there, witnesseth, the T is not crossed, and we see another law, a leading S. Um, down here, we have to the said James Doswell. Again, 204 uh, acres. And then we've got some stacking down here, sort of by the land, by the land and by the land, since this is a uh, essentially a, uh, a deed. Uh, again, the importance of context. Uh, in the right-hand corner of this document, I can see that this is uh, the word attorney is there. And so I can see that this is a legal document of some kind. And so we've got uh, some uh, uh, context clues, what type of documents and what words are around it. So uh, where I have the arrows, the words are for the PLT against the DEFT. And I see that there's a name Joseph that is uh, sort of at the end. So uh, obviously we can know that PLT is gonna be plaintiff against the DEFT defendant. So again, the type of document that it is is gonna help you to kind of figure out uh, what, um, what the words might be. Um, down here where that middle uh, arrow is, again, we have the word quarterly, and what is quarterly? Sessions with our long, our leading S or our long S as well. And then aforesaid, which is sort of a sort of an antiquated term uh, that we would use, meaning it's just been uh, the, the statement has already been uh, been made. Again, more legal terms. Well, a lot of documents are legal terms. They're difficult because we don't come across those words uh, very often. Um, so here again, we've got witnesseth and um, aforesaid, test testament. We've got half, which is uh, have, um, doth, do, uh, do assigned. Uh, and again, what do we notice here? The person decided not to cross any of their T's. But thank goodness it's actually uh, consistent. And then we don't, uh, we can figure out what the, uh, the word is that they are saying. So spelling challenges. Uh, don't underestimate how people can butcher the English language, either in speech or in writing. Um, and a lot of times you'll see something that is uh, spelled and it's phonetic, it's spelled phonetically. So here the example is, I seat, S-E-A-T-E, myself to answer yours epistle of the 16, which came to hand a few I didn't know what that word was, but I know days ago, and that looks like an F, and that looks like a W. So again, 
using the words around it, I uh, can figure out that that is uh, some sort of F-E-I-U-W, some kind of spelling for few. Uh, great, G-R-A-T-E, satisfaction. Uh, satisfaction with a, uh, with a D. And at the very end, uh, glad to hear that you was well. Uh, I am well uh, at this time. Again, spelling challenges, don't underestimate those. So grammar and punctuation, and I'm gonna have to look at my notes for this so I can uh, give you the background. Let's see. So this is a letter that uh, we found on the Making History Profiles of Honor uh, page. And it's a letter from a young man um, named Henry White to uh, who is his um, sister-in-law, I think, Anna Teresa Tessie Bosch. And you see that there she is, uh, dear Tessie. And he's writing um, from Camp Lee, uh, which is now Fort Lee, in August of uh, 1918. And the penmanship is pretty good, but he doesn't like to use a lot of um, punctuation. And he has a problem with uh, uh, capitalizing words. So your letter received OK and was glad to hear from you. I guess you are well and feeling fine and doing hope so anyway. I think that's a period. I wish I could be there right this very minute. And if you had not finished your book, I would be glad to help you. I could, I have to take a breath. Even though there's no period there, I've got to take a breath. So again, don't underestimate how uh, 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 grammar and punctuation can, can work their way into, uh, into these letters. And just a, a curiosity, I've been doing a lot of uh, proving a lot of these um, World War I um, documents and uh, the God bless the soldiers, they were doing, uh, they were doing really good work and, and writing home, but boy, their, uh, their spelling and, and handwriting and, uh, and grammar leave something to be, uh, to be desired. And one last fun example of, again, what's that word? Let me get to my, so this is um, a letter that we found from the World War I Profiles of Honor. And it's a letter from a, a young man named uh, David Castleman, a soldier, to his girlfriend, uh, Mary Pride Jones. And he is writing from France, let's see, in April of 1919. And he's writing to her that he's about to come home um, soon. But he's writing, uh, he says, today noon, I broke the news of my expected early departure to Madame Cloche. She seems quite uh, distressed. She says it will be very, and I didn't know that word, here after I shall have left and that she is going to close um, up uh, here and leave for Madagascar. And that word I didn't really know. I knew he tried to drop some conversational French in there and um, it, uh, and so I thought, well, I know that little, that letter is an X and I think that's a U and I think that's an E at the beginning. And so I typed in E and UX and put in the said French word, World War One, and it came up as on you, which is the French word for uh, boring. So again, uh, context is really important. Uh, Google is your uh, is very much your friend, and um, if uh, uh, in terms of trying to figure out sort of what's uh, what might be happening in these documents, especially when they're using terms uh, that we're not familiar with, or if they're using terms that are from uh, from uh, or, or foreign language uh, terms. And there's Anna. All right. So. I find that if you're stuck on a word, it can be really helpful to go letter by letter. Even if the result looks like nonsense, it may help to see the word clear. Or if you type your nonsense word into Google, it may magically autocorrect it into something that might make sense. Um, so enter your best guess into a search engine because it could be, um, again, like, like John was showing you a lot of phonetic spelling or even an archaic word that you're not familiar with. Um, I know I've learned a lot of new words going through the transcriptions that it didn't look like a real word, but when you look it up, oh, it, it does exist. Um, and be sure to use the context around the problem word to help brainstorm what it could logically be. Um, I know it can be, like, 
it can you can get it stuck in your head that you think you know what it is, but it doesn't really make sense in the context of the sentence. So be thinking about the context. When you're really not sure, you can put your best guess in brackets with a question mark, or you can put illegible in brackets in the places of the mystery or words so that coming someone coming along behind you who might have an idea of what it is can replace that with their, what they think the word is. And then the more you transcribe it, the easier it will become. Common abbreviations, phrases, and styles of handwriting will be easier to understand. Don't be afraid to ask for help, and a second opinion can make all the difference. I know I still have to ask for help or get someone else, get a second pair of eyes to look at what I'm transcribing. And the more you transcribe, the better you'll be. Um, there's always more to learn. And then these are some links that are some resources that have more good examples of many of the topics covered in this presentation. Other institutions also crowdsource, crowdsource transcription um, for documents so that you may have find other institutions where you can do different transcription um, opportunities. It's exciting to contrib contribute to the searchability and readability of documents for future researchers. And I think that is about all we have. Is that all we have, uh, Anna? I think so. There was one um, on the things to look out for slide. I did notice that we were. That one? Uh, the things to look out for, yeah. Uh, I wanted to call attention. I believe that this phrase is deposition of witnesses. Witnesses, thank you. I did read yeah. that wrong. Um, so that you can see that first P looks very similar to the double S in witnesses in that second half of that. Um, so that can that can be tripping, you know, but it doesn't. <laughs> no, that's a good that's a good catch. I think I actually took that slide. I think you were supposed to read that slide. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> that's all right. Anything else that we need that uh, that we may have missed? I think we covered everything. I'm excited to hear what questions people have. Yeah, so I need, I think we've got some questions maybe. Hello, um, thank you. We do have a few questions that have come in. Um, let me go ahead and read a couple of those off to you. So from Doug, the first question is, are there any writing books that were used in colonial times? So I think this would be like writing books that people maybe were learning to write. I'm sure there were. I, I don't know any off the top of my head, um, to be honest. I, I have no doubt that there were, or there were at least horn book uh, kinds of things. Uh, Anna, do you have any ideas? Um, yeah, I think, um, at least I'm searching, it seems like there's some, like, like the sample alphabet that towards the beginning that they would have sort of sample writing um, examples. I'm not aware of any like books specifically on right? so there may be like some sort of like a guide, but not everyone sort of followed ex everything exactly. A lot of people had their own styles. Well, we may have to get back to you, Doug, and see if we can find any books on handwriting. Um, Anna, can you please flip back to the slide with the other websites? That one, yes, the helpful links, and just leave that up. For people while we're chatting so they can google that if they want to take a look at those um, let me read another question that came in from susan she asks um, somewhere along the line i got the idea that when a document was transcribed it has to be done verbatim word for word with spelling and grammar errors etc but i am hearing that we should fix things like names that are separated when do we transcribe the document as is and when do we fix it? So that's a very good question, Susan. And I answered a little bit in the chat, but I just wanted to make sure that you um, felt like your question had been answered. Um, we do usually want you to include everything exactly as it is um, in the original document. What John mentions about just rejoining the words that are split across lines, that's just so that the full text search actually recognizes those words and can find them. So that's really the only change we would recommend that you make. Any other changes, um, we would ask that you make in square brackets, and that is to note that this is different from the original document. 
John or Anna, anything to add about that question? Anna's done a lot more than I have, so I'll, I'll defer to her on that. Yeah, that, that's pretty much exactly what I would say, yeah. Okay, we have a question about abbreviations from Kelly. Um, Kelly asks, do you find that if people use an abbreviation for a name that they use it continuously? For example, using Eber instead of Ebenezer, would this person always be referring to themselves as Eber? John, any ideas? Uh, yes, they actually would. A lot of times what they'll do is uh, um, they might say, uh, in the uh, in the uh, salutation or something, they might use somebody's uh, somebody's uh, uh, real name, full name, and then use it as a shorthand uh, throughout the letter. Uh, I've always been surprised how many legal documents uh, use um, uh, J and O for John or J A S for uh, for James. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting that a legally binding document, the abbreviation was was well accepted. What about you, uh, Anna? What do you have to think about? Um, I would say generally, most like I, most of the abbreviations I've seen were, would be consistent, um, but sometimes you may see it abbreviated in one place or and written all the way out in another place in the document. Like if they may write the name out in the body of the document, but then abbreviate it in the signature. I've seen that before. Mm, yeah. um, so it may not always be exactly the the same, but most abbreviation formats I've they're pretty consistent. Okay, good tips. Um, our next question comes from Troy. And Troy asks, is there a good handwriting OCR program that can assist with the transcription? So Troy, um, you know this, other people may not. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. And it's a computer program that recognizes characters <laughs> such as letters. Um, you have to train it to recognize a letter. For instance, you would say, these are all examples of what an A can look like. And then you would train the program to recognize things that look like that. Um, I've worked a little bit with uh, training OCRs and I'll have to tell you that there is not a great one uh, for handwriting right now. We use OCR technology on our Virginia Chronicle site for newspapers, um, those are more consistent. But when you think about the variety of handwriting, um, it's just very difficult to make a good OCR program for those. Um, just the human variety of all of the letter shapes that we might make. So I know that there is ongoing research into a handwriting OCR program. Um, I believe that the Vatican museums and archives were actually leading the way in that, the last thing I saw about it. But we're always keeping an eye out. And until then, we are relying on transcribers like those of you in this session to help us transcribe Library of Virginia documents and make them searchable. So I hope that answers your question, Troy. Um, I'll keep moving down the questions. Um, Rachel asks, any tips for transcribing census or other schedules where the literary context is not available as they are in letters or correspondence? Anna, do you want to take that one? Um, so, sorry, so the, the, you're saying that there's no context for the document, is that what the question is? Yes, if it's something like a census or just a list of names, something where there's not a lot of context, how do you start to decode that? Mm. Yeah, lists of names can be tricky additionally because like they're, they can be written in different hands or be unfamiliar names, but um, I would just take it one step at a time um, and go through like if you're really having trouble again go through letter by letter or like kind of just play with it and decide like it, see if it makes sense because um, you're not yeah you're not always going to have context um, clues but um, yeah I think that's really good advice the only thing I would add is uh, tr and in in the census record. Uh, and and the, the question is a good one because I have seen 
the worst penmanship uh, and census uh, records than uh, perhaps anywhere else. Uh, find a word or a letter, as Anna said, that you can absolutely recognize. And then sort of use that as kind of a key to move into other records. And so if there, if there is, you know, uh, John Smith uh, is listed somewhere and you can tell, okay, that's how this person wrote a capital S and an M, right? And go through and say, okay, pick out each letter as Anna was saying, and then you can sort of, you know, uh, develop how this particular census enumerator or county record person uh, uh, is writing out the sentences. Um, the other thing I would say, just as a, a warning on the census record is, um, there's multiple ways that census uh, names can be uh, butchered. So you've got the person at home that is giving the name to the census enumerator. So are they you know, enunciating their name? And then you've got the census enumerator who's listening. Is he or she, did they hear it correctly? Do they have hard of hearing? Uh, and then on top of that, then it's written down. So you've got at least three places where names can get butchered in census records. And, and that, that is unfortunate because you'll see something and it's like, well, that, that really can't be the person's name. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So, so that's a really good question. And unfortunately, there's no magic, uh, magic cure for some of those. Okay, thank you for those tips, Anna and John. Um, that can be very difficult when there's not a lot of context to, to read the handwriting. Um, Ruth asks, do you find that there are certain handwriting differences between different regions of the country? That's very interesting. That is, Anna, do you have any ideas? Well, I feel like most of the documents that we have are, are gonna be from Virginia and around this area. So I don't know that, um, I personally have had not, not had that much experience transcribing other documents from other parts of the world. Um, but I'm sure there are probably idiosyncrasies like that are specific to different places. Um, and as you get used to that, to reading more of them, you kind of get used to them and, and see them, uh, like see that pattern and start to evolve. But um, I was I was hoping that Anna had more experience than I did. I'm about the same way, essentially, in terms of um, doing a lot of transcribing and approving. The, the one thing I might just throw out there is um, in other areas of the country, the Northeast, uh, the education system, you know, pre 20th century was much better than it was, let's say in the South. Um, so you might expect to find better penmanship, uh, better grammar, punctuation, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I have seen that in just small uh, batches of documents that I've worked with over the, over time. Um, but I, I, that's more of a speculation slash uh, supposition than anything else. Okay, thank you for those answers. Um, we had a question here about um, unnamed children, unnamed babies, and using the abbreviation INFT or infant to describe those children um, in an 1850 census. Um, Chad asks, are there any other terms for an unnamed child? Um, maybe someone a little older than an infant. Well, in census records, I've actually seen no name written in the line where there should be uh, a name or it might be blank. Um, so, uh, but other than uh, I've never seen the word toddler or young person or something like that. Um, it, it, it seems that uh, infants were not named immediately sometimes like they are now, right? And people would have a baby and sort of wait on um, naming uh, uh, him or her. Uh, I've seen that occasionally in census records. Uh, for the infant, as you say, but not for uh, anybody, any uh, older um, um, children. Okay, we have another question here from Donna. Donna asks, um, can you explain people drawing their letters versus writing? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the distinction is between drawing your letters versus writing. 
Um, is that a, something that you, John or Anna have heard of? Uh, not me. <laughs> okay, well, we may not be able to tackle that one today, Donna, my apologies. Um, there are a few questions asking about a handout. There is not a handout from today, but this presentation will be available as a video that you can rewatch later. Um, and we'll put all of the links um, in the description of that video so that you, they can be clicked on. We have a question from Vicki who asks, what advice do you offer for reading letters on thin paper where people wrote in one direction and in the other direction, writing across previously written lines due to limitation on paper stock. That is very difficult to read. And have you come across that? I have come across it before. Um, and this may not be the case with every instance, but it, it, in some cases you can kind of focus on the slant for going horizontal because of the, as opposed to the, the vertical ones, all the, the, the person writing is gonna naturally like slant a little bit to the to the right so that might be a little helpful um but i know it's hard to tune out all the noise of the other writing that's going over top of it so it just kind of trying like and trying to focus on the, the line the um, horizontal line by line and just sort of tune out the vertical <laughs> stuff as you're going and that's the, the best that you can kind of go for it's really it's tricky though <laughs> I, I, and is exactly right. What I try to use when I run across that is I will use a ruler and use the ruler as my vertical line. Um, and I mean, a horizontal line. And that way I can sort of, you know, as, as Anna said, drown out the noise of the other, of the cross line. So just scrolling through all of your comments and thank you for everyone that has entered questions and comments into the chat. I love seeing where you're giving each other tips um, as well. So let's see. Um, Lee says, I notice wills use standard phrases and language. Is there a template of standard phrases usually used in wills from different eras? I'm not familiar of a specific template. There might be something online that you can just sort of you know, poke around. Um, I know, uh, but you're exactly right that there are some standard um, salutations and closings uh, for legal documents. I'm not familiar of any precise uh, websites uh, or links. And have you seen any, uh, any um, uh, aids for that? Um, I was gonna say, I would recommend uh, like a legal or law dictionary. Um, for we'll have a lot of terms and I've also come across like Latin phrases that's going to be helpful for that um, if it's something that you're not familiar with and sure it's, it, you're thinking it might be a legal term uh, so that was what I would recommend yeah I think looking in those legal dictionaries and other sources like that can really help you um, understand those wills I think on the transcribed site, we have links to Black's Legal Dictionary, which is one of the um, well-known sites for that. Um, I'll look for that link and try to drop it in the chat here in just a minute. Susan asks, do you know the abbreviations in newspapers of instant and proximo? I have not seen those exact abbreviations. Are those things that you have seen, John or Anna? I don't think so, you said specifically in newspapers? Uh, yes, that was the question, but if you've seen them anywhere in legal documentation, uh, that might be helpful. Like instant, I've seen, like, or like that's something I'm not familiar with Proximo, but I've, I've seen instant before. Uh, oh, they I've can seen, be in obituaries, perhaps? Um, I've seen them, um, I've seen instant much more in legal documents in terms of something that's happened instant and kind of sort of a timestamp. Um, sort of thing. I have not seen um, uh, Proximo uh, myself. Well, we may have an answer from a, a participant. Susan says, Susan White says, it refers to the dates this month, next month, and last month. Proximo can equal the, the previous month. Um, so those are very helpful tips that you all are sharing with each other. And thank you for bringing your knowledge today. Um, scrolling through, I think we have addressed all of the specific questions um, that I saw come in. 
Well, Sonia, if I can bring protocol, I'd like to ask Anna a question. Anna's done this much more than I have. And I'm curious as to if she, what kind of unique things she's been seeing in, uh, in transcribing and approving uh, documents. I know she's been in what, Charles City lately? I've gotten pretty used to the, whoever the scribe for the, the book was, it's handwriting. So that's been made, made it a lot easier to, um, to get through those. A lot of questions about the recording becoming available. Um, I will just say that we are recording today's session and we will make it available on the library's Facebook page and YouTube page uh, very soon. We usually do just a little bit of editing to trim it, and then we put it up usually within a week or so. So keep an eye out there if you'd like to review the slides. Um, is there anything else that we want to revisit today before we um, conclude the session? Any other questions you all may have? Well, folks are thinking about questions. I did, something just did occur to me. Um, if you're going through documents and let's say on the first or second page, you're having trouble with a word. Um, I often will uh, move ahead to another page and maybe they have used a similar or that same word on a different page, but actually spelled it better, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, so uh, again, uh, as Anna has said, uh, you know, try to look at the style uh, of the person's uh, handwriting and help you uh, letter by letter. Um, and I would also say uh, uh, if you get sort of uh, frustrated at a certain word, uh, sort of just move on. Um, you know, we don't want the uh, transcriptions. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a, a positive uh, experience. Um, and I think the uh, um, on the Making History site, we asked that you put it in brackets with the legible. Is that uh, correct, Sonia? Yes, absolutely. And was there anything else that we uh, we needed, we uh, wanted to cover? I don't think so. Like you can, you can. I was just gonna say again, reiterate that you can put in a legible if you really have no clue, but you can also put your best guess, even if your best guess is. A jumble of letters and what, what you see of the of the word that could still help the next person coming along who's looking at the document. Yeah. So I've added a, a link in the chat window uh, that goes to our virtual volunteer sessions. If you would like to put your transcription skills to use, we would love your help on any of our crowdsourcing projects. Once a month for the next year, we will meet virtually on Zoom like this. Um, to work on some of our crowdsourcing projects, including Transcribe, Virginia Chronicle, which was mentioned that hosts all of the library's newspapers, um, and also From the Page, which is another crowdsourcing website. So we'll be working on those three sites, um, and please use that link to register. It is run through Hands On Greater Richmond, which is a local volunteer uh, group. You do not have to be local to participate, however, you can join from wherever you are today. So just know that there are more sessions coming up. And if you have additional questions, you can always email us at makinghistory at virginiamemory.com. We're available to help you with your questions. Um, and I hope that you have enjoyed it. I'm seeing lots of great comments come in. Um, thank you all for joining us today and especially for sharing tips with each other. That's wonderful. Anna and John, any parting words? It's like keep at it, practice, practice, practice. It's all about continuing to do it. Um, and like the more you, the, yeah, the more you work on it, the more like things you'll uncover more things that will be, start becoming more familiar. Um, and it's pretty exciting. I I enjoy it a lot. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, Anna's exactly right. Practice, 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 and. Uh, Thanks for uh, joining us today. Absolutely. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. So keep it up with reading old handwriting, and we hope to see you again at a Library of Virginia presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.